let's just uh, let, let's talk a little. See, here's the thing. Okay, I have figured out the most simple way to explain irony, and it is this: irony is a meaningful gap between expectation and result. Expectation is the bedrock of irony, and it is expectation's relationship to other things that create different assortments thereof. For instance, there is a gap between expectation and ambition. This could be uh, called Steinbeckian irony. You might think this would apply to the Ronald Reagan Federal Building, which is the largest federal structure in Washington, D.C., but named after a man who thought government was the problem and did everything he could to shrink government. <laughs> but that's not, that's not uh, irony, that's just uh, shit luck. Jennifer Grey, in the early 90s, with several major feature films at her back, decided to get some rhinoplasty, and in so doing, took the wind out of the sails of her career. She herself said that she went into the operating room a celebrity and came out anonymous. Steinbeckian irony is basically when you do something that you think for yourself is a positive move and has the exact opposite effect. Then we have expectations gap with fate. This could also be called cosmic irony. When you're working on a car and you drop a tool, it will always roll to the center underneath, <laughs> always. And you might think that's cosmic irony, but that is not, that's just Murphy's Law. <laughs> cosmic irony is the left brain's penchant for rationalization to ameliorate the sheer terror of living, in fact perpetuates the mysteries of life itself. That is cosmic irony. So then, you have uh, the gap between expectation and identity, also called auto-irony. And this is most often used when people do cameo, stunt casting of celebrities in cameos against type. So, for instance, there's, of course, Raymond Burr, who never smiled in his entire career, and he appeared in Airplane. Ted and I were very close once. We had the kind of relationship where we laughed and laughed and laughed all the time. Do you know what it's like to laugh like that? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. So if you, if, you, if you are a fan of Raymond Burr, this is a very funny joke. Uh, but that is actually not even auto-irony. That's just deadpan and glorious, glorious deadpan. In other uh, lectures, I talk about the secret to good deadpan, you guys, is relax all four cheeks. <laughs> True auto-irony, however, this is a perfect example. William Shatner came out with an album called Has Been in 2004 and uh, he covered common people among other songs but speaking it not singing it uh, and it had the reverse effect he was pushing on the bruise of where his career was at and he revitalized the thing and now he is who he is and so that is brilliant auto irony then there's a gap between expectation and protocol otherwise known as elevator irony so this is when the, those awkward moments when you're on an elevator and uh, you have like four floors to think of something funny to say <laughs> and you're standing too close and you're both going to be getting off of the same floor so you just turn to each other and you're like Friday's coming! <laughs> you know what I mean? Then you get off in either direction. It's hard. I, every day and I'm completely out of elevator material and I've seen everybody on the floor over and over again my entire... So then you start to just like confess horrible things like there's blood in my stool! So... That is, uh, that's just charm. <laughs> Protocol irony is, for instance, when Andy Kaufman would go around to colleges while he was on taxi and uh, the students would file into the auditorium and he would start reading The Great Gatsby from page one and they'd be like, ha, 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 and he read the entire book. <laughs> and, and by the end, no one was in the, they just stormed out eventually angry. That was his whole show, which was genius. <laughs> so, God rest him. If he's dead. <laughs> Somebody uh, theorized to me recently that perhaps Trump will rip off his mask and it will be Andy Kaufman. And he will indeed have made America great again. The gap between expectation and decorum, otherwise known as double entendre. The, you might think this is the band, the Fat White Family, or uh, uh, Guar, but it's not. That is just shock mercantilism. True double entendre is, uh, for instance, the uh, Barrison sisters who, in the 19 aughts, danced the can-can, and then they would say to the audience, would you like to see our pussies? And the audience would be like, ah, ah, and they'd lift up their skirts, and they had kittens strapped to their crotches, <laughs> like uh, cod pieces. <laughs> That's double entendre, if I've ever heard it. At 1906, they were doing that. Uh, there's a gap between expectation and awareness, otherwise known as dramatic irony. 
and this, you might, I'm sure you're all thinking right now, oh, right, like the communism subplot in Clue, but... <laughs> communism was just a red herring. Communism is just a red herring. <laughs> True dramatic irony is, of course, uh, these are the best examples. It goes in two directions. There's the sixth sense when we didn't know Bruce Willie was dead the whole time. And then there's the scene in uh, Breaking Bad with Hank Schrader on the toilet. I'm sorry, you've had this much time to watch it. <laughs> Where, I won't explain it, but basically he looks at the inscription of this book and he's like, I can't believe it took me four seasons to figure this out. So uh, either the character knows something that we don't, or the storyteller does, like The Sixth Sense, or we know something the character doesn't. That is dramatic irony. Then there's the, the gap between expectation and information, and this is uh, verbal irony. You've just provided me with the makings of one hell of a weekend in Dublin. <laughs> when he won the... Oscar for My Left Foot, which is very good. I mean, so the, guy, the guy can act himself out of a paper bag. And he had that classic Irish thing of total understatement. And the thing, the thing about the Irish, I went there for like seven days. So, and I am Irish, but many generations removed. Here's the thing about Ireland. You wander around and it is so absurdly green and there are fucking triple rainbows everywhere that eventually the beauty makes you furious and you just want to like give the finger to the clouds because and there's a word for this because you start to experience the mathematical sublime which is the feeling of being so overwhelmed by nature to the point of annihilation and that's it this is it this is like somebody's like front yard or something like that it's ridiculous and so there's no there's no way you can actually put words to a thing there you have to understate it, basically. I'm not unwell. Uh, I didn't hate it. Uh, she didn't totally keep living. But, that's, but that is not verbal irony, actually. That is understatement, a.k.a. litotes, which is uh, denying of the opposite understatement. True verbal irony actually can also take visual form. This is how people get around the censors on the Chinese internet, how uh, dissidents will make people remember it because this, the, the tank photo is scrubbed so often. And so rubber ducks have taken on this, uh, this extra meaning of uh, military oppression. This famous photograph from the Depression is also pretty fascinating as a bit of visual irony. And verbal irony would be something like Anatoly France's famous quote, the law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor from sleeping under bridges and begging in the streets and stealing bread. Then there's a gap between expectation and authenticity, otherwise known as postmodern irony, uh, formerly known as romantic irony. So you might think this is like uh, normcore, which is just the worst, but normcore is actually more of a bit of sarcasm. Truly, this would be the perfect example. <laughs> Genius. Genius on every level. It's so good. <laughs> and did they ask permission? Were there meetings? Or were they like in the middle of the night? You know what I mean? Okay, so then, <laughs> there's the gap between expectation and intelligence. And this is Socratic irony. And this, you might think, would be like a Senate hearing where they're like, explain to me like I'm fine. But that's more like a wryness is a, a Senate hearing. Real, uh, real Socratic irony in our modern day is Borat and, and the episode of the TV show, which I don't know if anyone's seen, where he went to a, a bar in the South somewhere and got up and, uh, during a, like a honky-tonk uh, open mic and sang this song from his home country called Throw the Jew Down the Well. And everyone like, started singing along and stuff like that. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. So that would be Socratic irony, revealing the imbecility of your opponent by feigning ignorance. Then there's the gap between expectation and rhetoric. This is a Orwellian irony. A good example would be No Child Left Behind or the Clear Skies Initiative, both of the Bush administration. Al Franken said in 2005 that it sort of makes sense if you think of it as the initiative to clear the sky of birds. <laughs> Best of all, the actual name of North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. <laughs> but this is actually obfuscation and not actual Orwellian irony. Orwellian irony is the idea that war is waged to create peace. This is a village 
that was destroyed in Vietnam and a uh, general during the time famously said we had to destroy the village in order to save it. So that is the fog of war and that is Orwellian irony. Finally, there's a gap between expectation and hubris, and this is historical irony. And you might think to yourself, ah, like when Brad Pitt injured his Achilles heel while playing Achilles. <laughs> but no, that is just coincidence. Actual historic irony is, for instance, when the cobra effect occurred in colonial India. So. There were cobras all over India, and the colonial British residents were freaked out by the cobras. And so they decided to put out a call and put a bounty on the head of cobras so that the, the Indian residents would take cobras in and receive a cash reward. So immediately, the Indian subjects of the crown began breeding cobras. <laughs> so that they could get the reward. And then the British caught on to this and ended the program, so then the Indian subjects released all their cobras. <laughs> and so that would be the opposite of what the British intended. And that is historical irony. And there you have it, you guys. Look, this is the entirety of irony. We did it. We, we just slayed another dragon. Oh, it's very exciting. Now... We can uh, drink dolphin blood from the skull of irony. This is, uh, this is an important thing because either we are the 21st century's plaything or it is our plaything. So what is the pattern here? Uh, the pattern, if you look at this whole area, this sort of Jeff Sessions, Kim Jong-il, Raymond Burr, Luke Skywalker, Tim Curry circle right here, this, all of these things, these minor ironies, which aren't really irony, all they really do is indicate notability, the notability of a thing. And all that does is make the world a little bit smaller. However, the outer ring, the outer circle, Andy Kaufman, the left brain's folly, Jennifer Grey, all these other things, these confirm the mystery of life itself and why it stays interesting. The, the inside is when you get the contrary of your expectation, and the outside is when you get the contradictory of your expectation, the exact opposite, because that suggests a weird symmetry to the universe, and that continues to give us a reason for living. And that, my friends, is as far as I got on irony. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.